remember, as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized, belong, believe, and behave. Lord, we thank you for you. Felix comes and he dies before you this morning that you would speak through me to be who you would have me to be, God. I move out of the way so that your word would go forth. And I pray that your word would touch a heart and touch a soul of someone out there that's in need of you. We want to be a church and a ministry that's about the Father's business, God. So we submit ourselves that you would be glorified in everything we do. So as your word is being proclaimed this morning, speak clearly, Lord. Speak clearly so we can be different, Lord, and we can be who you would have us to be. So I submit my will. I submit my desire. I submit my way to you that you'd be glorified in everything. So as your word goes forth, if there's one there that don't know you as Lord and Savior, draw them to a relationship with you. Draw them in, God, so they can be who you would have them to be. Speak through me, Lord. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. As you go to that passage in the book of Luke, um, let me begin by just saying this to you, then we're going to transition in the text. I believe it was Bill Hybels, um, the author. He's the lead pastor at um, Willow Creek Community Church and the author of the book, Courageous Leadership. He coined this phrase where um, after 9-11 in his book, he opens up with the statement that the church really is the hope and solution for all the problems that the world face today. Does anybody believe that this morning? The, the church has the answer. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. It really is the hope and has answers for many, if not all, of the problems that the church, face, the world faces today. I'm one of those guys that believe that the church really is a hospital. It's a place where the sick can come and be healed. It's a place where those that are facing the challenges of life can come and find hope. It's a place where the depressed can be encouraged. It's a place where marriages are hurting. Um, ladies and men that are trying to raise children by themselves can find community. And it's, it's just simply a place where we can come together and encounter God and meet God who really has answers to whatever we see ourselves going through in the world. The Bible says it this way in Matthew chapter um, 11, verse 28. He says, come unto me, all ye who are laboring and a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The following verse says, take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, but my burden is light. And the problem with that invitation is that we are good at coming to Jesus when we find ourselves in need, when we find ourselves going through, when we find ourselves struggling. But the problem is we want Jesus to do for us, but it seems as if we don't want Jesus himself. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? I want God to bless me. I want God to heal me. I want God to do for me whenever I have a situation. But there comes a point in time where I need to return the favor and do for God. Are you with me? So what happens is we receive from God and we go away and we, re we refuse or forget at times to go back to him and express gratitude, express appreciation, express thankfulness for what he has done for us. And we miss that from time to time. The text we're going to look at this morning speaks to these 10 individuals who had a similar situation. They were hopeless. They needed help. They needed solution to their problems. They needed hope. They, they were ostracized from society. Jesus comes and he heals. And in his healing, as opposed to all 10 returning to express thanks, only one returns and say to him, Lord, I thank you. My opening question this morning is, have you thanked God lately? <laughs> yeah, turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor that question. Say, neighbor, have you thanked God lately? Come on, turn to your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, have you thanked God lately? Amen. Amen. Let's read the text and then... We're just going to walk through this passage and see what God is saying and hear from the Lord this morning so he can speak to us. Go to verse 11 of Luke chapter 17, and I'm going to read 11 through 19, and we'll come back and talk about the text. 
Verse 11 begins by saying, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was uh, met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voice saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Verse 19 says, and he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. There are three things that I want to share in this passage in front of us this morning. Three major themes that I want you to take away from the text as we kind of walk through it and look at this passage just in front of us. And the first being is as we look at this issue, talking about the, the issue, staying on the theme of radical discipleship. I need every person in here to know this morning that one of the things Jesus will do for us is he will go out of his way to encounter us and allow us opportunities or the opportunity to express faith in him. Okay, Jesus will go out of his way to encounter you, to encounter me. And then in that encounter, he gives us opportunities to express faith in him or express gratitude and faith in him. If you look at the text, go back up to verse 11. And let's walk through verse 11 as we look at this carefully and see what the Lord is saying. It begins by saying, on the way to Jerusalem, he being Jesus was passing along Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village. Um, he was met, as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers. Come on, say 10 lepers who stood at a distance. Don't miss that. And lifted up their voice saying, Master, have mercy on us. Now, I'm reading to you from the ESV. I'm pretty sure your translations are very similar. And it's very, very important that you not miss the details that's nuanced in the text or the details that the author Luke gives us so we can really understand what the message is saying. The verse opens up by saying, Jesus now was on the way to Jerusalem, but also says that he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Now, what struck me about that, if you've done any church history or if you've looked at any current or recent maps of the Palestinian region, and you're going to Jerusalem, it's normally a downward route that goes from north to south, and you start at the north end, and you make your way down on the south end to get to Jerusalem. And if you listen carefully to what the author is saying, Jesus now is on his way down to Jerusalem, but What's striking about this opening verse is it says he's not taking the north-south route, but interestingly enough, he seemed to be going out of his way because he's passing between Galilee and Samaria. Now, now what's striking about Galilee and Samaria is that Galilee is to the north and Samaria is to the south. So if I'm passing between Galilee and Samaria, it seems to me I am going out of my way or I'm delaying my journey to get to Jerusalem by going either east to west or west to east. Don't miss that. That's striking. And, and the reason I want to point that out because I want you to hear me say that Jesus will go out of his way <laughs> to encounter you to allow us to have an opportunity to express faith in him. Now, being the divine God that he is, being the, the omnipotent God that he is, he knew that there was someone along the way that needed to encounter him. Now, notice what the text says. As opposed to going north to south to get to Jerusalem, he's going east to west. And then look at what happens. He's passing by a city. And what's striking about him passing by the city is the people that he's encounter are not inside the city. They are in the distance on the outside of the city because my Bible labels them as outcasts. They're lepers. 
Come on, does this make sense? And if you look at the details in the text, the lepers weren't standing in the city, but they were standing at a distance away from the city. Because if you know anything about leprosy in biblical times, if you were considered a leper, you were considered an outcast. Because leprosy was some sort of a skin disease that's equi- some, what we, the closest we would know it as today, it would be equivalent to one having AIDS or HIV, and you were labeled at a, as an outcast, and you had no dealings with the residents of the city. Come on, say, man, y'all know this. You've been in Sunday school. You understand all of this. So, so here's what would happen. If you were labeled a leper, you were ostracized from your family, you were ostracized from members within the city. You were ostracized from members of the community. And you were placed outside the bounds of the city itself until your leprosy was either dealt with or you died. Now, what's, the other thing that you need to know that's striking about the leprosy is that if a person was categorized a leper, socially they were equivalent to being categorized in the same category as dead people. They were unclean. So a healing from leprosy would be the equivalent of being raised from the dead. Okay? Now, one more thing before I move to the text that you need not miss about the text is by virtue of the fact that he was walking between the region of Galilee and Samaria, and you know the whole issue of of these Samaritan peoples not being mixed interracially, not dealing with other nations or ethnicities of people. I find it striking that you're going to see in the text by virtue of the fact that we probably had Galileans and Samaritans and Jews mixed in the group of lepers their leprosy knitted them together. Oh, y'all missing this. <laughs> there was no social distinction because they had a common sin. Come on, does that make sense? Are you with me? Now, now as Jesus, as Jesus is going by, because I, 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 I'm just going to say this, then we're going to walk through this. I, I'm wondering if there's a person here today that might have something that have caused you to be ostracized. And I'm not talking so much about a sickness. Maybe it's an ailment. Maybe it's a failing. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe there's something broken in your life that's not where it needs to be, where people aren't seeing you for who you are. The good news is this morning, Jesus is going out of his way today just to meet you. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy. I'm happy. I don't know about you. I'm not, but, but I'm excited about the fact that he went out of his way to find me. Because, you see, if you know anything about my testimony, I was not sitting in Jerusalem waiting for him to arrive. He had to take an east-west route. And in that east-west route, the cash bar might have been around there. Come on. The drug den might have been. Oh, come on, y'all. The prostitute. Come on. Whatever it is our failing was, it was not on that north-south route straight to Jerusalem. He had to go out of his way to find me. And I think I'm not by myself because there's some of us in here, if you're honest with yourself, we were on that east-west route, yeah. And we weren't in with the crowd. We had separated ourselves. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I had someone in here. And look at the text. He says there were ten lepers and then who stood at a distance and lifted up their voice saying, Master, they said, have mercy on us. Here's what you need to know about that plea. And here's what you know about Jesus going out of his way. Remember with me, as lepers, they were socially ostracized from their community. So as long as they had leprosy, they were probably family members that they hadn't seen. Understand, they couldn't go to the local mall and go shopping. Are you with me? Understand, they couldn't go to the local restaurant and eat when they were hungry. Understand, there were some of the benefits of society that they were separated from. So here's their plea for mercy. Jesus, this does not feel good out here. I need you to heal me. I need you to heal us. I need you to perform a miracle in me so I can get back to the normal way of life because the way I'm living right now does not feel normal. And what I really like about that is when you look about the east-west route, for those that are feeling abnormal this morning, Jesus has gone out of his way to encounter us. Come on now, to heal us. 
and to get us back to a place of relationship with him. So number one, he will go out of his way to encounter us and allow us opportunities to express faith in him. Here's the second thing I want you to take away from the passage this morning. That is, and this one is catchy because Jesus will bestow mercy on us in attempts to begin the process of moving us in the direction of expressing true faith in him. Y'all just say amen. We'll work this out. He will bestow mercy on you in attempts to begin the process of moving us in the direction of expressing faith in him. Let me say this in English because some of y'all are missing this. He'll show up, heal you, and back up and see what you're going to do. Come on, does that make sense? Let me say it another way. He'll show up, he'll get you out of the mess, and stand you right beside the mess, and back up and see what you're going to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's a bad marriage. What he married? A bad marriage. Maybe, maybe it's a financial predicament. Maybe it's the fact that you're broke. So what he'll do? He'll bless you with some money, and then he'll back up and see what you go. Y'all not hearing this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he will bestow most mercy in attempts to kind of move us in the direction of expressing faith in him. Look at the text. Look at the text. When he saw them, he said to them. Go and show yourself to the priest. And the next verse says, as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus, have mercy on me. And there's no interaction between Jesus and them. There is no questioning between Jesus and these ten lepers. There is no laying on of hands. There is no casting out demons. There is no touching. There is none of that. Just the release of a word. I wish I could. And here's the word, because this is where this really gets catchy. And, and I'm praying that the Lord will give me strength to kind of make it through this. Go show yourself to the priests. And it says, as they went, they were healed. Now, here's what you need to know about what's happening here, because here's what Scripture says. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but he came to what? Fulfill the law, meaning now that these gentlemen were caught between the Old Testament law and the New Testament era of grace. And considering the fact that Jesus had not yet died on that cross of Calvary, the obligation was, if you were considered a leper, Levitical law says in Levit Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, that only the priest could perform the examination to see whether you are ceremonially clean or not, and only the priest could reinstate you into community. Are you hearing me this morning? So here, here, and I hope some, some of y'all aren't missing this. Here, Jesus stands. And then he says, they're out in the distance. Hey, Jesus, have mercy on us. And here's what Jesus says to them. Go show yourself to the priest. Because understand with me, understand with me, don't fool yourself into thinking they had a face-to-face -face relationship because had Jesus encountered them, he would be labeled ceremonial. Come on, y'all know this, unclean. So they're standing in the distance, and understand with me, he's passing by between Samaria and Galilee, meaning they had no close contact. And he's out, and they're over there where Robert is. There. Jesus, have mercy on us. Here's Jesus, don't show Some of us church phobia, don't come near me. That's what we would do. Are you with me? Now, what's striking about the text, excuse me for using this term, these jokers started walking in the wrong direction. And so they walk off. And what I like about the text, it, it didn't matter what direction they went in, 
By virtue of the fact that Jesus had released the word, he had already spoken healing. So regardless of what direction they went, the healing was going to take place anyway. I'm going somewhere with this. Because remember I said to you a couple of weeks ago that God is healing a whole lot of us by virtue of the fact that he says, take up your bed and walk, and a lot of us missed it, okay? Now, here's what the Old Testament law says, is that if you had leprosy, you had to show up to the priest. The priest would examine you, and don't fool yourself into thinking that the priest would touch you because they didn't have surgical gloves back in that day. So if I'm a priest, I got a long 10-foot pole. Raise your hand. Turn your neck. And I'm examining. And if you find, if he finds you to be ceremonially unclean, here's the second thing that he would say to you. He would say to you, now go to the, to the, um, to the temple and offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. Go show yourself to the priest. And in the going, my Bible says they were healed. Excuse me. In the going, they were healed. Here's the text. Here's the text. Here's the text of point number two. Jesus will show up and he'll uh, you do what? He, he'll bestow mercy to begin the process and he'll step back and see what you're going to do. Now, what I like about the text, it doesn't expressively say this, but it's implied in the text. He released the word and he didn't go nowhere. Not to offend nobody. Let me see what these fools going to do. And so they left. And in the going now, let me read, 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 let me read. Let's read. Look at this, what it says here. Let me get ahead of myself. Go and show yourself to the priest. Verse 14. And as they went, they were healed. Now, <laughs> let me say this and I'll come back to it. If the great high priest is standing there and says to you, go show yourself to the priest, and you go in the wrong direction, which priest are you going to see? And remember with me, I said they were caught between the old laws of the tradition and the new laws of the New Testament. And my concern for a lot of us today with Christianity is we find ourselves in the same place. We're caught between doing things as normal and what God is really calling us to do. And the thing that we're so used to doing normally, even though Jesus is trying to perform the miracle and he's teasing, we're so used to doing what we do that we miss the God. I wish I had somebody in here. Are you with me? I wish I had somebody in here, okay, that you can get this. Because if I'm in the presence of Jesus and he says, go show yourself to the priest, I may not know who Jesus is. But if I realize that I'm sick, if I realize that I'm an outcast, if I realize that I'm a societal reject, if I realize that my skin is filled with leprosy, and I know the priest could only examine, the priest cannot heal. If I know that if, if I show up and I'm still sick, all the priest can do is say to me, go back in the wilderness for seven more days, you're not healed yet. And then somebody says to me, go show yourself to the priest. I might not know to come to him initially. But in the going, Grandma them say this where I looked at my hands. And my hands looked, yeah, yeah. They said I looked at my feet. And they did too. Yeah, y'all know it. Come on, yeah, yeah. If I'm walking and in the go and I realize that my healing has already taken place, and this priest that I'm sent to had nothing to do with my healing, I'm changing course, baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back to the one who brought the healing to find out what's special about him that all he has to do is release a word. Y'all not hearing me this morning. 
release a word and my healing is taking effect. And here's the thing I want you to say. Jesus will bestow mercy on us in attempts to see what we're going to do. And here we are. Lord, have mercy. I can't pay my bills. Money show up. And here's the first thing we do. Go, Oh, Lord, my blessing, I'm going to go buy a car. And we keep going in the wrong direction. Y'all not hearing me this morning. Lord, deliver me from Bubba. And God deliver you from Bubba. But then you see Sammy in the distance. Lord, thank you for setting me free from Bubba. I can go to Sammy now. And you never change course. Come on, does this make sense? Does this make sense? Okay. I mean, he, he will set us up to see where our faith really is. Because notice what the text. Look at, look at, look at, look at. Let me go to the third thing, then we're going to talk to this. Faith is established when we recognize God as the source of all blessings. And we do what? Return to him. To do what? Give him thanks. Look at the verse. It says in verse 15, then one of them. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with what kind of a voice? A loud voice and fell on his face. Where? At Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Let me read. I'm going to come back to this. Now, he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, were they not ten uh, cleansed? Where are the nine? Was one not found? Um, was no one found to, retain and to return and give praise to God? And I love this, except this foreigner? I'm going to read that one last, the next verse last. Okay, lock into this. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his feet at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Notice what the text does not say. What's implied in it? He ran and caught up to where Jesus had reached by then. Doesn't say that. This is why I'm saying Jesus stood there and watched to see what he was going to do. He's watching there to see what you're going to do. He's standing there watching to see what I'm going to do. Understand with me, prior to the, the time of the text, There was no near proximity of the man to Jesus. He starts his direction in the other way. Then he noticed he was healed. Notice his position when he returns. He now approaches Jesus, has access to Jesus. He can touch top. He can touch Jesus, he can fall at his feet, and he can worship him at the, at the very core of who he is. And so the thing that I want us to understand, faith is established when we recognize God as the source of our blessing, and we return and give him thanks. Look at the point number two. He will give you mercy, and then he'll back up to see what you're going to do. The nine were more concerned with their own personal agenda than God's mission. Very, very important. Remember with me, we were ostracized from society. We didn't have access. Go show yourself to the priest, and all they heard was, if the priest declares me clean, I can go home. If the priest declares me clean, I can be reintegrated into society. If the priest declares me clean, I can continue on with my life. Listen to me, church. And this ain't in the sermon, but I need to say this. If your agenda, your personal, if our personal agenda is more important than worshiping God, something's wrong. Let me show you what this looks like in church. We're so busy serving in church that we forget the God of the church. We're so busy, <laughs> if it's playing an instrument, singing a song, praying a prayer, doing whatever it is, we're so focused on getting it right 
that we miss the God that gave us the assignment. The goal of everything Jesus does, or God does, is to get people at his feet, not to make you feel good, look good, or get any glory. Come on, does this make sense? Okay? He wants us to return and express gratitude to him because the healing really is in the return. Come on, does that make sense? Okay, very important. Let me read it again. Let me read it again. And then we're going to talk to this, verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And the verse says, now he was a Samaritan. Then, I'm going to come back to that. Then Jesus asked three pointed questions. Hey, man, weren't three, I mean, ten people cleans, cleansed? Where are the nine? And he says, was not one found to return and give God praise to God except this foreigner? <laughs> Don't you find it strange that the longer we've been saved, the more commonplace relationship with God is? And it's the new believer that's more excited? Are you hearing me? So much to say about the forum. We're going to pick that up. But here's where I want to land, and I want to share some theological thing. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you what? Whole or well. One more time. Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you whole or well. Important statement I need to make. And prayerfully, a very convicting statement. Faith is established when we recognize God as the source of the blessing and return and give him thanks. That word, go your way, your faith has made you whole or your faith has made you well, is the same Greek word, sozo, that says you've been delivered. And the same word that translates in some of your translation, saved. Very, very important concept. So here's the thing. The nine was healed, but they were not delivered. <laughs> you wonder why you can't shake Bubba? It's because you're healed, but you're not been yeah, because you haven't returned to give him thanks. You wonder why you're still going to the Euphoria store? I mean, that's the church down the street. Nobody in here. It's because you've been healed, but you've not been. Yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying. And the reason you've not been delivered is because in your journey, you had a momentary release from the thing because he released the word saying you're going to be healed. When God said it, it's going to happen anyway. You're healed, but the trait is still there. The core is still there. The thing on the inside is still there because you haven't come back to fall at the master's, at the master's feet yet and give him the do that's rightfully do him. You wonder why that bottle still has you? It's because you've been healed, but you really haven't been. Yeah. And healing doesn't come at a distance. Have mercy on us. Go show yourself to the priest. And a lot of our relationship with God is from a distance. Whenever we need help, we cry. Listen, if you're close, you don't have to yell. You can just whisper. He'll hear you because you're right there. So when you're laying at his feet, I wish I had somebody in here. You see, delivered folk lay at his feet. They stay in his presence. Come on. They stay right there because they know how to say thank you because it's not about them. It's about God. What happened to the nine? They went shopping. Because they had plans. And they wanted you to do for them so they can do for themselves. Radical disciples return and lay at the master's feet. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? And, and, and the challenge I want to put forth this morning, don't be 
in the nine. Be in the one. And so hear me out. Hear me out. When I say, have you thanked God lately? I'm not talking about on your way to work, Lord, I thank you because I forgot to pray. No, 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 no. Remind yourself when you wake up in the morning, the first thing I'm going to do is lay at his feet. Are you hearing me? I'm not saying thank God after you don't have half a turkey leg down your stomach. No, 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 no. Oh, you hear me? I'm saying while the food is in the oven, Lord, I thank you for the fact that you provided food. Lord, I thank you for the fact that my family is here with me. Lord, I thank you. And before you touch anything, you seek first the kingdom of God and his right. That's radical discipleship. That's the one that Jesus is looking for. Foreigners. People who are aliens in this world. I'll be a foreigner for God any day. Because that's what he's looking for. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to say thank you. And I'm praying that you will come back. And you will say thank you. Because that's where the true worship is. Does this make sense? That's, and I'm done. Pastor Katani, come. Worship team, come. There, there's, there's three theological things I need to share with you about the text, and I'm done. Faith is belief in Jesus that results in gratitude. Here's what that means. If you know God, you'll become a worshiper of God, a servant of God. Okay, here's the other part. There is no caste system when it comes to God's healing, grace, and salvation. In other words, God doesn't show favorites. The church is the hope for the world. The lame, the cripple, everyone has access. The righteous, the unrighteous, we all have access. But here's the last thing. Many will receive healing in their lives. Only a few will encounter God in their healing. And here's what that means. If God has healed you, delivered you, set you free from anything, and that thing still has you, you might want to consider encountering the God of the healing versus just celebrating the healing itself. Does this make sense? So I'm still asking, have you thanked God lately? Here's, here's me. You know, as a preacher, you preach and the message convicts the daylights out of you first. <laughs> So Felix needs to make some changes. Put God first, praying to God, crying out to God, making sure I really stay at his feet, and making sure I'm never positioned in the distance to have to call him from the distance, and making sure I'm always the one who returns, and never forgetting the fact that he's the one who did what he did for me. I want to invite you to join me. And be a sure enough radical disciple for Christ. So if you're here this morning and you have not said yes, you haven't given your life to him, you haven't submitted to him, you haven't surrendered to him, maybe the message is speaking to you. Stand to your feet this morning as we go to God. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're gracious. Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're kind. You go out of your way, God, to encounter us. And how dare we not come to you? You're saying come to the great high priest. And we keep going in the wrong direction. But you'll still go out of your way and cut us off again. <sighs> Forgive us, God. Forgive me us all as a congregation. Let us put you first. So now, Lord, if there's one that, like me, is willing to repent, say, God, forgive me. We come to you. If there's one who, in the crowd of the nine, saying, man, sorry, Lord, I've been in the nine. I need to come get whole salvation, sozo, deliverance. The Son of Man, Luke 19 and 10, continues by saying, you came to seek and to save the lost. So if there's one today that's lost, bring them, bring them. If there's one that wants to rededicate their life, bring them. 
Bring them. Bring them. Do only what only you can do. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. If God is speaking to you this morning, come. Come, come. Wherever you find yourself, if he's talking, come. We want to pray. We want to connect with you. We want to just touch. If that's you, come on. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who. No caste system in God. Come. Come. If as a preacher I can say, man, there's times when I forget and I find myself out there and I got to come back. Gosh, I'm no different. Come, come. If God is speaking, don't worry about who's looking or what. Just You just come this morning and allow God to be God. Is there one? Is God talking this morning? Believers, we need you praying. Come, allow God to be God. Come on, Pastor Tom.